This video clip is part of the EPFL introductory course on information computing and communication. It is the fourth in a series of video clips on computer security. After presenting cryptography basics in the previous video clip, this next clip about information security will cover two topics. First of all, the use of cryptography for implementing information integrity and digital signature. And then, mechanisms for ensuring the availability of information against its loss or destruction. Having discussed how confidentiality can be implemented with either symmetric or asymmetric algorithms, let us now move to the next information security topic, which is integrity mechanisms. Just to remind you once again, the threat that we're up against here is the unauthorized alteration of information. Integrity mechanisms aim to ensure that accidental or malicious information alteration cannot happen without being detected. This is again achievable with cryptography. And the principle is again illustrated in this slide, which is to be considered from right to left as in the past. Assuming we're just after integrity and are for the moment not concerned about confidentiality, the information itself need not be encrypted. We just need to ensure that it cannot be altered, not that it is confidential. This can be achieved by passing the information through a so-called hashing algorithm, which computes a complicated mathematical summary, in practice, in practice called a digest, of the information to be integrity protected. This digest, and only this digest, is then encrypted with some algorithm under some key, typically a symmetric algorithm using a secret key. The encrypted digest is then stored with the information or transmitted with the information. And to verify that the information has not been altered, a user can, on one hand, compute the same digest from the information, and on the other hand, decrypt the digest attached to the information. If they are the same, then the information must be genuine. Otherwise, it must have been altered by accident or by malice, as it generated the digest that is different from the original one that was encrypted with the integrity protection algorithm. Of course, there can be many 10 megabyte pieces of information that lead to the same digest. So one information could be altered into another one with the same digest. The crux of this issue is that hashing algorithms are so complex that it is practically impossible to find all pieces of information that share the same digest. Thus, it is not possible in practice to alter a million dollar check into a billion dollar check because these two would definitely have completely different digests and any unauthorized alteration would immediately be detected. This slide now shows exactly the same thing in the typical Alice and Bob scenario we saw before, using symmetric crypto with a common shared secret key. One could also implement integrity with asymmetric crypto algorithms. However, in this case, one actually gets more than just integrity. For the same price, one also gets accountability over and above integrity. Once again, to remind you, accountability mechanisms are meant to defend against repudiation, i.e. someone denying that they did something. Or more, specific, more specifically, in this case of information accountability, someone denying that they wrote a given piece of information. Accountability mechanisms make everyone responsible for their actions, in the present case, proving who wrote the given piece of information exactly as a signature would on a piece of paper. Information accountability is implemented by means of so-called digital signatures, not on paper, but in a computer, 
which use asymmetric crypto in a way similar to how we used symmetric crypto for integrity. Starting again on the right of the picture, a digest of the information to be integrity protected and signed is first computed. However, instead of being encrypted with some public key, which anyone could do, it is in fact decrypted with the author's private key, which only the author can do because only he or she knows that private key. Now this works because asymmetric crypto algorithms have the property that encryption under public key and decryption under private key are commutative. Thus any party with access to the information can immediately verify who it came from by encrypting under the claimed author's public key the digest that was originally decrypted under that author's private key. If the result of that encryption matches the digest that the verifying party can compute by itself, then the information was not altered and it truly came from the purported author. Otherwise, the information was either modified or else it did not come from that purported author. This slide again shows exactly the same thing in our typical Alice and Bob scenario, where Bob signs his information, for instance the mail or a web post, with his private key. That way, Alice, or in fact anyone else with access to the information, can readily use Bob's public key to verify that the information was not altered and genuinely came from Bob. Before we leave the topic of cryptography, we need to address one more issue, the distribution of cryptographic keys. For Alice and Bob to use cryptography, they of course need to know one another's public key or share a common secret key in a symmetric crypto scenario. Exchanging such keys with a secret or public face-to-face -face, is rarely a possibility since the participants may often be separated by a network. Exchanging such keys over the network would however be unsafe as they could be seen or faked by intruders. Ensuring the confidentiality of a secret key would require encrypting it under some other secret key thus leading to some sort of a chicken and egg problem. Similarly, ensuring the integrity and the authenticity of a public key would require digitally signing it under some other private key, thus again leading to a chicken and egg problem. Indeed, if Alice and Bob exchange their own public keys, for instance via email, an intruder could intercept the emails and replace both public keys by public keys that it made up and for which it knows the matching private keys. That way Alice and Bob would exchange signed and or confidential messages thinking they were talking to one another when in fact they would be talking to the intruder who could sign and encrypt all their messages as if it was Alice and Bob. In practice, such chicken and egg problems are solved by resorting to so-called certification authorities, called CAs, which are trusted by all parties. Everyone registers their own public key with a mutually trusted CA, face-to-face -face or via some trusted channel outside the network. At the same time, the CA gives everyone its own public key. That way, when Alice and Bob want to communicate, they simply ask the CA to send them the other participant's public key. In a digital signed and possibly encrypted message that they can verify as being authentic since they know the CA's public key. Of course, not everyone in the world can have their public key certified by one single CA. In practice, there are many CAs they simply cross-certify, in other words, trust one another's public key. That way, Alice and Bob can still authenticate and trust one another's public key, even if these are certified by different CAs, as long as those CAs trust one another, possibly through a chain of more intermediate trusted CAs. 
This closes our brief introduction to cryptography. While providing integrity and digital signature of information is highly desirable, it is not sufficient to ensure that it is always available. Just to remind you once more, availability mechanisms are aimed at ensuring that information remains accessible even when copies of it may be lost, destroyed, or unreachable. The standard way to implement availability is through so-called backup mechanisms. Backup is in fact nothing else but a fancy name for meaning that one should always maintain two or even more copies of any perennial information. One interesting question, of course, is how many copies should one maintain? The more, the safer, but also the more expensive. Another question is where those copies should be kept. A local copy next to the original is better than nothing, but in case of local computer or power failure, fire or flooding, remote copies are essential, though more expensive, of course. A third question is how often such copies should be made. Monthly, weekly, daily, hourly, immediately, the more often, the more expensive. In practice, the answer is a risk management decision that depends on the criticality of the information. Making backup copies of your iTunes music is unnecessary because Apple has all that backed up in its iCloud. Making copies of your family pictures on a weekly basis may be okay, but you may want to keep the copies somewhere else than the originals. For your working files, class notes, homeworks, reports, banking records, etc., it is wise to perform local real-time backups and then remotely save daily or weekly copies. For that purpose, think about cloud services such as Google, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, etc., who offer beautifully designed, convenient, and reliable backup services for all your devices. Just be aware that these are all American companies operating under U.S. law, which provides zero protection rights to foreign nationals and must readily submit to NSA surveillance. You may not have anything to hide from the United States. Still, the very idea that foreign services can spy on you without restrictions is highly disturbing. For maximum security and privacy, you should prefer backup providers in your homeland and prefer those that encrypt all of your data before it even leaves your computers. This being said, the volume of online data is multiplied by four every year. The resulting data volume is such that very little of that data has any chance of ever surviving as long as the famous Rosetta Stone. If you are directly confronted to that world of massive databases, Making even one backup copy is an expensive proposition given their size. It is also an uncertain proposition because such databases are so massive that even the smallest hardware error probability is enough to guarantee that some of the data in any copy will be damaged by some single hardware bit error here or there. <laughs>